you for uh, this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together with you to be here as your children and as you're looking over us as a father and as a master as we are your children and servants looking to learn more of you and your word and just to serve you and to just be at peace with all you have done, continue to do in our lives as our forger of our souls and as a potter of our lives, just breaking and remaking us and into your image. We thank you for the times of trials and times of valleys and peaks and ups and downs that you continue to help us and gain us uh, more insight to you and your word. But we also know in this life and this world we have physical things we go through and the situations of family. We think of Pam's mother and the situation there with you continuing to help with having the healing be needed and the, s the sustaining provision of your, your peace and your guidance to those internal situations of the blood and the, and, and, the, and the brain and on the head and the situations of alleviating those things and through it all guiding the, the doctors and nurses and the care and just the support and just the confidence and faith in you through it all for everyone involved. Think of Blaney's parents as well and she's with them and so many things up and down there and the health and the situations and the dynamics of her heart and the need there to strengthen her and continue to remind your love and your sustaining grace is there continue to just uh, provide and be strengthened and encouraged as she's being used to care for her parents and just thank you for all that you continue to do and thinking back on the loss of many people this time of the year a year ago lost their children they're in this uh, week a year ago and down in South Florida and we just continue to think about so many things around the world, so many tragedies, people lose loved ones and through the heinous sinful acts of mankind. And we just ask you continue to uh, help us to be empath empathetic, sympathetic, uh, understanding of those situations and, and see in and through it all that, you know, there's your, your sovereign hand, your peace, your love, your, your restoration, your, your hope that you give to each one of us out ahead of knowing that it's all just one big learning experience that we can't change these things of ups or downs but to learn from it all so thank you for the book we just came out of it philippians learning now from paul to continue to look on you only continue to learn those things we look now to the q a that we do and looking into again more about you and your word guide direct be our pastor our teacher our counselor our guide our teacher in this time we look for you we, we ask for you to be now this uh, insight for us the guide for us to see the truth see you and help us understand what you want us and to learn and understand and know and apply to our hearts and minds, souls, and spirit. We thank you for all you do and continue to do in our lives. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Um, I know there's so many unspoken things that, that I haven't even um, in my mind, but I haven't probably said directly about all the different needs that we have physically and, you know, through our lives and through our families and loved ones. And so we just continue to lift all those things. Uh, constantly and uh, but through it all grateful and thankful for each and every one of you and for what the Lord has done and continues to do not just in his, in his ministry in his congregation but how he has used you to encourage me and I thank you for that so uh, the the lesson for today of course is the Q&A we're a little late uh, we usually do that in the first Friday of February we had a uh, unforeseen situation with I couldn't do that and then we had the uh, review of chapter two and three of Philippians, which I thought was necessary for the flow of thought. So now we're doing the Q and A. So we'll do another Q and A as normal back on the cycle for March, in in the first month, um, because we're going to be having some time away coming up in March, where we're going to miss some of those Fridays. Um, so there was two questions again uh, from Vicky and and Laney. They the questions usually that I have are like really like bullet points sometimes and uh, you know Sheila's been fantastic about doing this thorough uh, messaging of, of things but it, this is the first <laughs> from Vicki and Laney I had to print it out because I didn't want to forget what you were asking because it was so kind of you know lengthy yeah, it, you know just kind of turning pages <laughs> but it's pretty funny it's pretty good you know, I, I like it I, I, I dig it so so when you look over into um, Vicki, usually I do the questions on or how I, I get them. Uh, but in this case, since Laney's was a little bit longer uh, than yours, I figured I'd do Laney's last and do yours first because yours was just one page and Laney's took up like two pages. So <laughs> I'm just having fun with you. It's all good. I love you. So 
With that being said, we're going to look over into uh, Vicky's question first. And it was in Matthew 22, uh, verse 7. And, of course, the story is, uh, the parable there is about the kingdom of the heavens and, as we know, about the Ariston. But we're going to read it, but first put the question out there. Yes? My name is Faye Glenn. You asked a long question, and uh, we can wait. No, no, it's fine. I got, it, it was actually fun to go through, and, and I thought, you know, I, 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 I had um, studied uh, those things before, and, but not in the way in which you're asking, uh, 100%, you know? So it was good, good refresher, good back, and, and, and digging into other things that was, that was new, and so it's good, and it was great. So that's why I love it. You know, whatever God leads you guys to, to say, it's always good. It doesn't matter if it's a short or a long, or it's just, it's always good, because I know that God's going to use that in some way to, to remind me, to, to, to school me, to teach me things that, you know, I, I didn't even know, or I need to fix, or I need to tweak, you know, stuff like that. So it's always fantastic. It, it's, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just being funny about it, because I think God's just kind of cool like that. He always does that. There's not one time I can ever recall a Q&A where I was like, man, that was a, I don't, I, no, it's always, it's always, it helps me. Um, as much as, I don't know, but, you know, as it helps you, it, it's, it's really good for me. It just kind of challenges constantly and reinforces, and, and I, get to, I get to go to the classroom with the professor, if you will, Christ Jesus himself, you know, it's awesome, so, yes? She said, it's been on my mind for a long time. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you asked, so, gives me a chance, like I said, to go to the classroom professor and say, Doctor, Father, God, I'm kidding. All right, so, Matthew 22, 7. So, the question that Vicki had is, I'm going to read, <coughs> sorry, Jeez, that was weird. All right. <coughs> Come on, really? <coughs> My apology. Sorry. I'm going to do that in your, your ear and on the microphone. Jeez. <coughs> Something got in my throat all of a sudden. I'm sorry. Hold on a minute. Goodness gracious. Something's in my throat all of a sudden. Oh. Wow. It was just something like right there. It's getting stuck. <coughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, like it was a seed or something. All right. So, uh, the question was you read Matthew 22 7, and it mentioned that the king was angry that his servants were seized and killed while trying to invite people to his festival. So, he, the king, sent armies of him and destroyed those who murdered his servants and burned the city. Wonder who the armies were exactly and what city was destroyed. The references at the bottom of the page, eyes in the Diglot, sent you to Daniel 9, 26. Here it says, people of the prince who was to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and references sent me to Luke 19, 43, 44, which in there spoke of a prophecy about Jesus about a time to come when destruction will come to the people and not a stone upon a stone because they did not know the season of the visitation or inspection. You have notes in the scripture already, uh, probably from when we were talking about that verse, Luke, the verses in Luke speaking to the emperor Titus, which is AD 70, and the first destruction of Jerusalem, also in Matthew 22, 7. But with the Daniel verses and to and the mention of the season of inspection, this speaks to the end time. How do you untangle the connected verses to know what time frame is which, and how are these, connect, how are these verses connected? And it's not vague, by the way. <laughs> no need to be sorry. That was pretty good. That wasn't vague at all. <laughs> so, all right. So let's go read the coupling of verses that you're, that's in question. That was your question, but let's read the coupling of verses themselves as they sit within Matthew 22, so for the context, we're going to read uh, the message, and I will go through the message, the scripture passage, and Matthew 22 uh, and verse 1, and Jesus continuing to discourse to them in parables said, the kingdom of the heavens may be compared to a royal person who prepared a marriage or a gamos, which is plural, for a son. So again, we know this is a reference to the Ariston and Daimon. It's in reference to a future event. Uh, but it's also in reference to, even though the future event is being talked about, we know that from the very opening, that's why I wanted to read the context, because the kingdom of the heavens is in hand. He's obviously referring to a future time, <coughs> but he's also looking into the standpoint of how this is uh, unfolding from things that happen currently or past and how they relate to the future. So one of the biggest references here to answer part of the question is there are foreshadows. And to remind you, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, for example, our amillennial friends, 
believe that he is the fulfillment uh, mentioned in the abomination of desolation in Mark, where he says, if you see this, uh, this, this abomination of desolation erected, you know, flee. So people that are amillennial, our reformed theologian friends, will say, oh, that's already been fulfilled in Tychus Epiphany IV in about 165 BC when he went in Jerusalem and he just, you know, uh, desecrated the temple, put up a statue of Zeus and sacrificed a pig on the altar. Uh, that's done, check that box. The Antichrist so-called prophetic uh, process you premillennial people believe in, uh, y'all are wrong. That, that's what they'll say. Because they use a past event that is a foreshadow and they think it fulfilled totally what the prophecy is about. But then you have to say, well, wait, wait a second. Um, there's other things that were supposed to happen about the Antichrist, and he didn't do any of that stuff. There was no uh, white horse and pale and black and the red horse. No, 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 no. None of that stuff happened. Uh, there wasn't any issues going on with the other things mentioned in Revelation with the, with the stars and the elements of nature itself changing. Um, I'm going to go with no. So just because one piece of what the abomination of des desolation represents was foreshadowed in that one godless king, because he was a foreshadow of the godlessness of the Antichrist. God's genius. Why would he not use a, a microcosm of a character trait and foreshadow a character trait also in a godless man who claims to be, have a right to rule over in Jerusalem and then also desecrate Jerusalem? What's the problem with God doing that? Does it mean that God's saying everything about this man has been fulfilled in the prophecy of the Antichrist? No, he was just a foreshadow of the character of godlessness and the disregard and devaluation of the land and place and temple of Jerusalem and Israel itself. So that's similar to what God does quite a bit in prophecy. He'll use past events to foreshadow a future event. And sometimes he'll use present events in lieu of how it ties it all together. But all three would be true. A past event, speaking of one piece. A future event, speaking of a piece in lieu of the, I mean, a present event, excuse me, speaking of a piece in lieu of the future event yet to still be fulfilled. So this is why some of the references in the scripture, for example, you mentioned in Daniel, they're referencing a future tense because they're looking out to a future, which this particular Matthew 22 event, they don't correlate, the, the scripture itself is not correlating exactly the context. That one piece you asked about is correlating to a foreshadow of events that happened that are yet to be fulfilled totally. And I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to kind of get that out there first off and foremost. So I hope that makes some sense what I just said. Um, so let's go back and read in verse 3 of Matthew 22. And he sent his servants to call those who are been invited uh, to the festivities. Again, Gamos, marriage feast, plural again, which is the Ariston, day 7, 1,000 years. Dipnon, day 8, 1,000 years. And they refused to come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Inform those who are invited. Behold, I have, been, I have prepared my entertainment, my oxen and fatlings and are killed and all is ready to the festival, ready to come to the festival. But they, discarding it, went away, one to his own farm and one to his merchandise, and the rest, seizing his servants, insulted and killed them. Now stop for a second. The kingdom of the heavens was at hand. Uh, well, excuse me, is the parable. The kingdom of the heavens was not mentioned until John the Baptist came on the scene and started to preach about it. The kingdom of the heavens was not was not being taught or preached during the times of the Old Testament. It just wasn't. So when John the Baptist was talking about King of Heavens being at hand, repent, and then Jesus comes around and says he picks up where John the Baptist left off, well, then that's because that's a new message. They haven't heard that before, which was why the, the consternation and division against who is John the Baptist. Was he a prophet? Was he not? Hence the reason why you had the the whole aspect of Jesus saying to them when they asked who, who are, what authority do you do these things? Remember he asked back like as, a, as a sarcastic response, well, what authority did John baptize? Because he knew that they knew that they were at odds with, I don't know, they, the people thought he was like revered as a prophet, but some of the Pharisees, Sanhedrin were like, I don't know what to do with this guy. You know, I don't, I don't know what, what, what this is all about. Because they knew there was a lot of strong authority in what he was saying. They just didn't like the fact he was against their mainstream message because he had a different message, the kingdom of the heavens being at hand and repenting and being prepared for it. Then it would take that I was talking about, right? So my point being that the parable starts off with the kingdom of the heavens because it deals with things that were specific to, unique to, and only in the timeline of John the Baptist and forward. He first started teaching it and preaching it as a preparatory cursor 
just a couple months before, as we know, we saw before Jesus being baptized, Yeshua baptized on the door. And so then Jesus takes over. So who are the people being seized? And well, we, we know this is from the people that were being murdered in Christianity, starting with first Stephen, not a disciple, not a disciple, apostle proper, a disciple, but not an apostle, but a very godly man. He's one, of, I, I would say, of all the people that were not apostles, he was pretty much up there. Uh, as like, like, like if, there's, if there's like 1A, if there's one, and then 1A, he's like a 1A. He's like right below. I mean, he's like unbelievable, uh, th this man, how he was astutely intelligent and at a heart as well sensitive and compassionate. And then the murderous intentions of all those against the people of God began to take place after that amongst other disciples, proper apostles of Christ. As we know, leading into the first century at the end, all of a sudden it really got turned up on the heat. Then the whole masses of, of once all the apostles were gone, except for when John was just left, then it started to really turn up the heat toward the end when Diocletian went out there and really started to murder folks. So when he's talking about this, this whole end of the first century, when that started to get turned up heat more, remember, under Nero from AD 65, was really, he, was when he was the first person that really made an edict that said, let's go out and kill them all. Remember that from our studies in 1st, 2nd Peter? That's not funny, right? So he was a very evil man. He's the one that killed Peter and Paul. So Nero, Nero is going to be an unfortunate soul before the judgment of God, taking out two of the faces and voices of Christianity in the early parts of post-resurrection Jesus. That's a pretty big deal in God's mind. I, I would be for me. So I would not like to be him. And then you got, of course, Agrippa, who took out James, the first one. Um, that wouldn't be something I wouldn't be proud of either. So that's something that you got to be, I mean, that's pretty sad. There's some people there that got to answer some serious stuff. So here when he says the king was indignant and having sent his, his, his military forces, destroyed their murderers and burned their city. Now, when he says his armies, his armies, the armies of him, as you put it in. So the reality is that when he's here talking in verse 7, the context you would think because it says armies of him and the king being God the father and then the marriage feast is for the son so you would think of okay well then it's got to be Jewish armies right because it's the king and that's God the father and well don't forget that God has shown throughout scripture that he uses Egypt Pharaoh rose up for my purpose Romans 9 he uses Cyrus my servant he rises up to buffet Israel he used Moab and Edom to buffet Israel he, he used constantly other people that were not Jewish, and he called them basically at his bidding to, for a purpose to buffet Israel. So even though they're not godly people, and it wasn't Israel or Judah proper, it was Roman, <laughs> but God did use the Roman Empire from which to institute, obviously not a coincidence, they instituted this whole crucifixion process, which happened to institute the fulfillment of how the Lamb was was skewered through and then turned and forming a cross and what a coincidence that's what a crucifixion does a beam one carries to be affixed to another beam that forms a cross that's not coincidence the, the fact that it you know you have these doors and lintels of the passover and then you have this uh, again two uh, side beams you know a straight a vertical and a horizontal you have all these different things that that are um, in, in relevance to uh, why he put Rome in, in place, not to mention, of course, how they took the uh, scepter from the Jews of the death penalty they could not exercise on their own. And so he knew that they would be the ones who would do this and so on. And so there's all of these reasons, of course, they were fulfillment of Daniel's uh, image and, 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 the, and the actual legs of, of iron. So you have a lot of different processes of it. It wasn't like a surprise to God. He did, in fact, show in the image of Daniel, the head of gold, Babylonian, uh, the chest of, of, of silver, the Medes and Persians, uh, the, the, the bronze of the Greeks, and then the, the waist. Then you have the, the, the legs of the Romans, the iron. Of course, so you have these already prophesied beforehand kingdoms that God's basically telling you that didn't even exist when he said it, which tells you right there he put them in place, right? So when he says his army, he's referring to the, to the empires, the kingdoms he's already put in place, which are for the purpose of fulfilling that image for the purpose of the net result, the net net <laughs> of Jesus coming in, Yeshua establishing the true kingdom and destroying all those. So when you look at his ar the armies of him, don't take it as a direct aspect of 
they serve God. It doesn't mean that. It just means that God's using them in the fulfillment of his decrees and how he has aligned prophecy already foretold, which he did foretell as prophecy before Babylonian, Medes and Persian, Greek and Roman. So if God foretold that before they even existed, well, then they belong to God's prophecy, don't they? They didn't come on their own stage, on their own will and own might. No, they did not. God told you straightforward, this is what's up. That's why even people that are uh, Alexander the Great, I met a person the other day who was uh, of Greek descent, and I said, did you realize when he was going through Tyre and Sidon and he was taking down the onslaught there and he came north, or came south, excuse me, from the north toward Jerusalem, it is, it is said that in is, is the Jewish history scriptures that he had an interaction with the Jewish people and they showed him in scripture the books of Daniel, or the, the book of Daniel, and the, the scrolls in there, and they said, look, th this is what you're spoken about, you know, the Greek Empire. And he thought he was, he was impressed by that and got to his head a little arrogant. And, and it said that because he read about himself in Jewish Hebraic scriptures, he did not pick any fights with the Jewish people per se. Remember, the Seleucid kings after his death were the ones that came in and caused consternation to the Jews in their temple and their worship. It wasn't him directly. It was the indirect out, outflow of what happened when his kingdom was divided between the, the Ptolemies and Seleucid kings, the generals that went north and south. So you have... Alexander, who was again another man that was a evidence of how he was seen in his own eyes as being used by God, even though he did not believe and serve God whatsoever. He's a polytheistic person. He was a bisexual person. He was an arrogant, self-absorbed person. He's not godly, but he did in fact like the fact <laughs> it stroked his ego to think that, wow, you know, I'm, I'm in this Hebraic scripture. So he actually gave respect to that and didn't mess with Jewish people. Still Hellenized them, made them into the Greek culture process, but didn't again desecrate their temple and, and do all those things. That was the fact that Epiphany the fourth that did that, which is again after his death. So again, it's trying to get to just some history and scale here. There's, there is evidence scripturally and historically that people have been used by God and seen themselves as being used by God, even though they're not believers in God. Nebuchadnezzar himself was used by God when, when Daniel was showing him, and he, he, he in fact converted, of course, and he said, whoa, you know, let's be the God of Daniel. But the reality is that we have this throughout scripture that God did change the hearts. Sometimes they convert over, sometimes they double down, Pharaoh against their, against their belief. Even though they once were shown, they, they turn against it. Uh, so on and on, we, we see this. So hope that makes some sense there about that piece of why it would say the armies of him. That's all rabbit trail to kind of justify and verify that piece of it. So when he goes into, when he says, and the king was indignant and having sent his military forces, that's the Romans. And he says, destroy th those murderers. Who are the murderers? The Jewish people who, again, when Paul showed you his own, his own intent, he was happy to fulfill the law of Moses. So they were going after anybody who was saying that they, they again, were anti-law uh, of Moses, house of Moses, anti-Sanhedrin. So remember, the Roman people did not know. They did not know that there was a different uh, Jewish sect of separate from them being Christianity. They thought Christianity was just a sect, not a separate from, just, just another version like Sadducees, Pharisees, and they just thought it was like the Essenes. It was just another sect of Judaism. They did not see it as a separate belief system until after AD 100. So please remember that. So the Romans, when they came in, they did not see it differently. So when he says those murderers, it wasn't them, the Romans per se, that he singled out the Jewish people that were now Christian, and Gentile folks that were now Christian. No, 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 no. It was the Jewish people who were the ones against those of Christianity. It was the Jewish people who were the ones against those who were inviting others, because it was, and by the way, this is evidence of the fact that what they were teaching and preaching in the early part of the ministry of Jesus, Yeshua, and the disciples, the apostles, it was about the full sperma. This is part of the leaven that's been lost. This Matthew 22 invitation of who is doing the inviting, doesn't happen like this anymore. The full scale of this was much more magnified because of the time frame, what was being taught, what the landscape was, who was present. But now Jesus died, rose, ascended to heaven, he gone. The apostles come and they start taking over the message, but then they're all gone. Uh, the majority of them are gone by 80, 80, 70. Only four are left to see that, remember? And after that, only one lives beyond into AD 100, and that's John. So the masses of the ones that were, were the core group had just been faded away through that first century. And so this particular message and this particular passage of this parable, it, the story he's giving is in reference to things that were only applicable to the full scale of what he's talking about in the first century. And ergo, he has to be talking about an event that happened 
in the first century because you can't have people at this large scale doing this invitation unless they have, guess what? The knowledge of the invitation. You can't invite people to a wedding unless you know about it, right? Well, they didn't know about it after the first century on a large scale like they did in the first century. First century was, um, was in the awareness and alertness. That was, that was the height. That was the height. That was the height of Christianity was the first century. After that, we fell off the apple cart big time, which is part of that leaven that the, that the enemy sowed. So kind of remember that too. So that kind of narrows down the time frame here. So when he says he burned, uh, he destroyed those murderers, again, the Jewish people who killed the disciples, the 12 proper, along with anybody else as it grew more vastly from AD 64 onward from Nero. Uh, 65 really turned up the heat and then you got this whole process where then he says it burned their city. Well, that's AD 70 in Titus. So when you're asking about, well, why does it refer to Daniel then? Because Daniel, remember, when uh, Titus burned the city AD 70, this is where people get, again, our amillennial friends have a lot of fun with this. So they'll go to Daniel and, and they'll go to Daniel 9, 27, as you mentioned. So let's turn there, and let's turn to da Daniel for a moment. And I wanna make sure we address this because your amillennial friends that you may have in your life are gonna point this out to you. So you better be able to know what they're saying because they're gonna go, oh, I see, they're gonna make fun of you. And, and they really shouldn't because they're the ones who have unanswered questions. Uh, it doesn't matter if you believe them or believe if you're a person on the outside looking in going, who do I believe, the amillennial, the premillennial? It doesn't really matter to who to believe in the sense that it's not about um, who has a stronger you know, presentation. That's not the point. The point is who has the most unanswered questions. And they got tons more unanswered questions that don't have answers to them. And whereas, again, I, there's not a question that they could probably rise up to, to our structure of how God's given our framework of understanding that we can't answer for them. We can, they may not like the answer, that's fine. They may not agree with the answer, and that's fine. But there's an answer, scripturally based. They don't have any answers. Like I mentioned before, if a target fifth needs the fourth is, is the Antichrist, then, then, then where's the peace treaty he signed? Where's it at? Where's the currency he established for the whole world? Where's it at? Th there's too many answered questions. You, you, don't, you have no answer for those, none. They can't offer anything for that, right? So when they read Daniel 9, 27, when he says there shall be a covenant with one week, seven years, in the midst of that covenant, three and a half years, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease, right? And so it goes into this whole process where it's talking about the end of, of the days, like you're saying. And so when he says the sacrifice to, to cease, they, they go, okay, that's the temple, and they, there should be no stone left on the temple. And so people would say, well, when in Titus 80, 70, destroy the city, they go, oh, that's fulfilling Daniel because he made the sacrifice to cease, which it's true, they haven't got sacrificed since then. So they go, you see, that's, we're done. There's no tribulation. And that's why sometimes people put that in there because they don't understand that that was a foreshadow of what was to come. And so it's a foreshadow that the, that the uh, Antichrist will come in and desecrate the temple and then Christ will actually, again, as we know, it'll be purged another time. He's, he's purged it before. He purged himself personally on the earth when he was here. All the gospel writers talk about it. And then he also purged it through emissaries of uh, Babylonian, through the Romans. Uh, yeah, he, he, didn't, he did that quite frequently. Yes? I think you said 26. Oh, sorry. I read the wrong one. My apology. 26. Okay, and then it says, uh, okay, my apology. I read the wrong verse. And after three score and 62 weeks, which is the 483, um, the part of the 490 weeks of Daniel, that's leaving out the week, 70th week. The Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuaries, and the end shall they be with the flood. So here they're talking about, again, uh, destroying the city, and they look at this. I'm sorry about the, read the wrong verse. I was ahead of myself there. But it's the same concept and, ta and thought here. The difference is that when the Messiah comes, then they destroy the city. And, and that's in reference to, that is true in, in Daniel 9, 26, again, when Jesus came, and then later on, Titus 80, 70, came after Jesus lived, died, rose again, no doubt, right? 80, 34, 80, 70, well, no kidding, right? Christ was before that. So, yes, it was a partial fulfillment of foreshadowing of what was to come later, that, that again, it would also be, be destroyed later when it comes to the fact that the Antichrist and the uh, end of the Armageddon, yes? Todd said, please slow down. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, so, okay, sorry about that. All right, so when you're, I don't mean to do that too fast, I apologize. Um, so when you're looking at the Daniel side of it, and he's going through the issues of the, the, the cutting off, and then you look at verse 26, and destroying of the city, 
that is in fact, yes, aligned with Matthew 22, 7 and a similar foreshadowing. So Matthew, so Daniel 9, 26 is speaking to the similar event of Matthew 22, 7 and part. So, so does Matthew 22, 7 fulfill Daniel 9, 26? No, it partially fulfills it. Just like Jesus partially fulfilled Isaiah 60 when he read it and he, he said, he stopped and he said, I'll give sight to the blind and I'll heal the lame and I'll give them a chance to, to, to jump for joy. But he stopped when about the next verse is about, and then I'll institute the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, <laughs> no, that did not happen because that's the millennial reign. But there was no chapters and verses, remember, in the scroll. So he stopped mid-thought. So this is not something foreign to our God, our Father, our Creator, the author of the book. It doesn't matter how you think, how I think, how you read, how someone else reads, how they write, how you write. That is irrelevant. What matters is, thus saith the Lord. And the first time Jesus read from the book, the, the Holy Scriptures, he read from Isaiah. And he started with the premise of letting us know exactly how he's going to teach with broken, fractured thoughts, with midstream cutoffs. Like, what was that about? He didn't finish the thought. He was giving us a huge red flag. Pay attention. Pay attention. I don't care what you think. Pay attention. Pay attention. Because I'm going to actually say this, but not say the rest of this. You think I should. You think it flows together. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's what Judas's problem was. Remember? Judas reads Zechariah, and he says, oh, he comes in on a donkey and a colt. Hosanna, the palm. And the next verse, well, there was no verses. The next verse says, he'll subdue the government under his feet. But, but that didn't happen. It's because Judas didn't pay attention. Because that's the whole thing that Jesus, Yeshua, started with by saying, look, guys, there's no secret. If you saw what I first said openly, not in a secret, and I got it, I got it. And it's in the synagogue. He stood up, read the verse, stopped mid. They're like, what the heck? And he goes, in your ears today, what you have heard has been fulfilled. They're like, what? Yeah, you heard me. And they're like, yeah, but you didn't finish. But even if you didn't finish, say what? Th that's you? I mean, it, it was like profound. They were caught with a conundrum of, first, who, who are you? Secondly, what? The, you, you, what? And then why didn't you finish? There's like three wows there. Who are you? Th th you just fulfilled what that says? That's been written over like 800 years ago? And, and, all, and all of a sudden now you're also gonna stop in the middle of what we always thought was a continuous flow and it, it's not? He's like, you're welcome. And he just walks away. They're like, well, what just happened? He like dropped, it's like a drop the mic moment. He just walked away. They're like, well, well. and that, that was the beginning of how his teaching style was elaborated. And so it's amazing to me how people want to force into God's word. I don't care if you're amillennial, premillennial, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever it is. People want to force into the scripture constantly what they think the flow should be. What they believe is an ongoing. You can't do that. Let the scripture be what it is. And I got, people, I got some people I've talked to. They get mad when they go, you can't go from that verse to that and go from this thought to that thought. And I go, really? God does it like all the time. Not, I didn't write the book. It's not my style. I can't comment. It's like trying to comment on why Picasso or Van Gogh or a famous composer, Mozart or Beethoven, why they do that movement. You know what? I don't know. I'm not that smart to do the composition. I'm not that genius to write the Messiah as God inspired me in like a couple hours, okay? So I don't know how to comment on how the movement of the arrangement. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I just know it sounds beautiful, and he was inspired by God, okay? So, glory to be to God. So, all I know is that God wrote the book and used a man to do it, and he did it in a way that he can break thought and, and not flow the way we humans think he should, and our Western Hemisphere thought and our Eastern Hemisphere thought. He's like, malarkey, samarkey, who cares? I don't care if you're Jewish, Gentile, black, brown, male, female, your culture of Greek and Hebrew, Hebrew it doesn't matter. He writes the way... You can understand more or less about culture, granted, but the way it's written is the way it's written. And you have to let God be God, let the scripture be scripture, and not sit there and say, it doesn't fit my theology, therefore I'm going to make it squeeze into a flow of thought. That's just, that's just bad. It doesn't fit, it makes sense. So when you look at verse 26 and you say, okay, and all the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and, and the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the, and, and to the end of, of the war. 
desolations are, are appointed. Well, was there not Jewish Roman wars? Yes, after Titus 80, 70 did what he did. There was Jew and Ro Roman wars. They went on for a while. And there was actually a Masada, by the way, look it up. It's not, so is that fulfilling a foreshadow of that? Yeah, but based on the context, was it completely fulfilled? No, because there was not a, a covenant being signed or a peace treaty. The, the, there wasn't one. The, 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 there wasn't one. So you did that. But was it a foreshadow? Well, yes, facts speak to that. But was it a complete fulfillment? No. It, I didn't write the book. I'm just pointing out the facts, right? So you have to accept that and go, okay, the same holds true for Matthew 22. When you read and say, okay, in verse 7, the king was indignant and having sent his military forces destroyed those murderers. Did, did, wait a minute, let's stop for a second. Did he kill all the Jewish people? No, no, some died. Did you know that, did you, did you know in Josephus' book before Titus 80, 70 happened, before he, because first he seized the city, he seized it just like they did in Babylonian days, by the way, he seized it. And that, that means they, for months, didn't allow any food in and supplies in, nobody came in, nobody went out. They wanted to starve you out basically. So then they, they finally would get you to you know, surrender. Well, and then when they got you in a weakened state, then they could really you know, fight with more strength and vigor than you could because you were, the idea was that you were malnourished and so therefore your energy level was much, much lower. Sickness came over you, things of this nature. Well, the reality is that he burns the city down, right? But in Josephus' writings, it says that, now this is not scriptural, but in Josephus, this is extra biblical. He claims that there was people who testified that there was angelic hosts that went throughout the city of Jerusalem and said, beware, leave now. Say what? And they believe it was like a fulfillment of what God was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah when he took Lot out with his wife and his, and his two, two daughters. It was a similitude to later on how God would then give another opportunity for the righteous to get out. And so it's amazing. And they said well, many left and some stayed. But obviously, so the reality is that, is that true? I don't know, but they, they, that's in extra biblical writings of Josephus. He talks about how that was something that people speak to. And you can look it up, it's in his writings. I don't know the exact reference for that, but I remember reading that many years ago. And so the reality is that, did he destroy all the murderers? No, but, wi but wait a minute, is that not a precursor of what's gonna happen in tribulation when he's gonna destroy also other murderers of himself? That, that the Jewish, because remember they said, let the blood be on, remember they didn't like Mel Gibson's passion because he had to change the English rendering to then Hebraic and it was not the bottom of the screen. They said it, they didn't translate it though, but he said it with their tongue that let his blood be on our hands and our children's children. Whoa, that was actually in the scripture. Mel Gibson put it in the movie, The Passion. There was a backlash from the Jewish people he took out the English rendering, but he kept the Hebraic verbiage in the movie, if you didn't realize that. They still said it. They just didn't translate at the bottom. So that was his compromise. Fine, you don't think I had it in there, but you know I did, those who understand the language, you know I had him say it. I just didn't tell the rest of the folk who don't know to appease you, but, because that's in the scripture. Well, did that mean all the children's children were, were killed? No, because you know 144,000 were spared, right? So the idea is not, again, to be taken as all the people were killed. So there's a lot of a lot of understanding here that if you can't, if you take it 100% of everybody dies, my point being, if you start taking things literal to what you want it to be versus what actually happened and matching it up to the events that you know happened, then you, you just have to, I mean, be reasonable with what God's telling you and not, again, get frustrated by the fact that God doesn't fit into what you may think it has to mean. It doesn't mean that. So here he says, and he burned their city, which is Jerusalem. So, and then, and then, of course, as we know, that is what's going on. So I hope that answers your question because you said, well, so what, how do I make sense of the verses? Well, it's a foreshadow. So again, to sum that up, you have, you have events, events past, then you have present, present lesson, which is Matthew 22. And then you got events future. And these, this one looks back, that one looks forward because they're, they're foreshadowed. They're a foreshadow to 
partial fulfillment. Unto the prophetic fulfillment. So the question that you asked me is, how do you put, how do you, how do you make sense of the verses? They're both somewhat true. It's, it's the narrative that people put on it by saying, this is all this, or this is all that. That's both wrong. Daniel 9.26 is a partial view of what happened in reality in AD 70, which is what Matthew 22 is talking about. However, Matthew 22 is talking about that as a precursor to speak to an event that's in the future, that it's the whole context talking about a future event from which a present event was going to happen in their timeline, which Daniel 9.26 is talking about a future event that would happen as a foreshadow of another future event that leads to that ultimate future event mentioned in Matthew 22. So you're like, what in the heck? There's like layers upon layers how God is talking. So again, I'll put this on the board for you. So Daniel 9.26 speaks to an event in the future that's in Matthew 22, 7, which speaks to an event in the future. This is a, this is a partial fulfillment. Ah, you know what? I'm going to do it like this. Events past. This is Daniel 9.26 here. Daniel 9.26 prophesied here and here. This is the best way I can write it so you can see what I'm trying to say. It prophesied it was a future event and a past event from what the lesson was being taught. So Daniel 9.26 was fulfilled here, but also fulfilled here. Because this was a, this was a, the here it was a foreshadow. It was a foreshadow here. And it's 100% fulfilled here. So when you say, how do I make sense of it? You, it it's cause you make sense of it because it, it's both. Daniel 9.26 was all the way back here when it was first was spoken. So Daniel 9.26 was spoken roughly about 600. Oh, not 600. Just hello. That's wrong. Around 540 B.C., and then this happened, the, f the events passed, which is A.D. 70. And this will be in the future event, which will be the tribulation period. And then it will be ultimately fulfilled during the end of that period. Matthew 22 talks about the events that happened even. And this event talks about all the way after here, what it talks about actually day 7. So Daniel 9.26, which was written in 540 B.C., talks about events that happened in A.D. 70, which is prophesied in a foreshadow, which then Matthew 22 mentions, and mentions that, and in, def, in essence, in the same way. It hadn't happened yet. But Matthew 22 is looking back at that prophecy as it was fulfilled in its future sense. It's going to be. But Matthew's looking forward again to its fulfillment in tribulation and tribulation and total fulfillment, which again looks into day seven and how it plays out because the context was the kingdom of the heavens. So Matthew doesn't care about just the prophecy. It cares about the prophecy and the ramifications from it. So Matthew is talking about the kingdom of the heavens and the ramifications. Ramifications of the prophecy. So that's the deal with, with Matthew. So Matthew 22 deals with the ramifications of the prophecy and the prophecy itself. Daniel 9, 26 is talking about the prophecy being fulfilled and what's going to happen. But the ramifications, how it affects us, wasn't really talked about. But Matthew 22 gets into that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's kind of, it's really, it's not vague. It's convoluted is what it is. It's really tangled tangled in, but you got to see for what, hope that answers, um, does it help you out, Vicki? You tell me. Yes. 
First of all, Todd said, I was taught that parables are truths that have already happened or will be a future event. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. What I said? Yep. And that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So Matthew's talking about what, what, what's already happened and the, well, the prophecy's already happened, but the event was going to happen yet when Matthew, when that was written, AD 70 hadn't happened yet, but, it w but it, it's a future event that could happen in two phases, not just one phase. So when you say it has already happened or it will happen, it could already have happened in phases or already happened in phase or going to happen in phases or in full. We, d we don't know. So there could be a partial fulfillment or total fulfillment in phases, or there could have been a past in the same way. As long as you understand that past future thing, that's true, but not, it's not, it doesn't have to happen in one event. So a parable could have been talking about a, a, a parsing of things that happened, or one, or one event, or a future one thing that happened, or a multitude of phases to fulfill that uh, piece it's talking about, or if that makes sense. Yes? Vicki said, I know this happens all over scripture, but it is very hard to grasp just what is being brought forth to us. So when we first read scripture, do we first think in terms of what message is being told? Then we look at the same verse and those that are referenced in a deeper level, which in this case is a foreshadow of future events. Um, yeah, you have a great, you have a there great question. Are so ways to best grasp how to discern this kind of verses. Yes. I guess not really, she said. No, so here's, here, here's what I tell you. So how you do them, I would do context, then details, then cursory. In that order. You say, how do I, how do I know? Context. Context is king, man. Context is king. Context means everything. The time, the audience, who's speaking, what's happened before, what's about to happen before that message was given, what was happening before, all that context, all of that. I say, con I don't mean just context of the verses. I mean of everything that happened before. Uh, you got to get a grasp of that, which means, guess what? Oh, man, I got to spend more time. Read what you haven't. Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> so if you want to have the best opportunity to get the right understanding, then you got to take the time. God's expecting us to do that. That's what being a student is, man. I know it's tough, right? You just can't. It's like going into a, a my car makes that noise. You go, well, if I knew what happened the week before that, it may have led me to an understanding of maybe what you, you, hit, you hit something or some other noise may have happened that I triggered your memory to because now I can understand maybe that, that led to that. So the events that... There's not, there's not a, out of nowhere, you know, <laughs> it's always something that led up to that, right? And then also what came after that. So that whole context of what's before and after and the actual event, who's speaking, who's speaking to, the time itself of the timeline, all that matters. Yes? Vicki said, is that just on the original verse or on those, on all those referenced verses? Context. Okay, so first of all, th to your, no, wait, no, it's a good, good question, great question. So whenever, your question is a fantastic question about does the context matter on the, the verse in question, or does it matter when, it, when you have a trail to other verses? Well, the answer to that question is depends. That depends on what the Lord's leading you into this situation. So the context of what, if, if he's leading you to, I don't know where God's leading you, it's, uh, that's on him and his spirit. I'm not the teacher, that's him, right? That's all him, he teaches all of us. He's our, he's our teacher. So he's our counselor. He's our uh, master, savior, shepherd, pastor. So, so, he, he, so if he says, okay, this is the context of this scripture, know it, daughter, son, and you go, okay, I got it, Lord. And as you're reading that context, then you're into, so you know the context now. You got it. You got the framework. You got the, you got the wine skin. You, you've defined the new wine skin he's given you. He's given you a wine skin to either base it on some old or make a new wine skin frame. And you're like, okay, I got it. Got the framework now. I've, I, I've, I've, had, I've allowed my mind to be expanded and my spirit to be open to your teaching. Now, I, I see, Lord, that I need to be open to what you're saying here because the context has now changed what I used to think about this. So my framework is ready. My oil, my wine skin's ready to receive your wine, your truth. Pour it in, baby. And he goes, well, daughter, son, do the exegesis. You're like, well, what that means? Read the verse in detail with investigation. Remember what Paul gave us the truth. Remember, you don't do it with a, <laughs> no, no. 
the foundation of love, Paul said. So the right intention has to be in your heart. You can't be doing this because I can't wait to prove so-and-so wrong. I can't wait to be so smart. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's wrong. That's wrong. Very dangerous. Very easy to do that, by the way. Very easy to do that. What you need to do when you got the framework, that's when you, before you pour that wine in there, you got to go catch yourself. Even when you're doing the framework, you should catch yourself. But, but especially before the wine comes in, the new doctrine itself comes in, you got to go, Lord, please, I, I, I want to hear, hear from you only because you. Only because I want to know more about you and your word. That's it. That's it. Not because someone can think more of me or I could fit in better or I could, I could talk to people better or I could be seen as a... No, no, none of that. None of that. I just want to be... I just want to love you. I just want to love you. I want to know you better. I want to know your word better. And I want to be used by you more. And I just want to know what you want me to know about this verse, about this chapter. Now, that's a whole different thing, right? So that's what... Paul meant, the Holy Spirit meant in Paul when he said, the foundation of love, Philippians 1, 9, and you build on that epinosis and discernment. Well, then you go into the details. Epinosis and discernment. You go into details, right? You hammer those bad boys out, line upon line, verse upon verse. Now, with, upon doing that, this is, where the, this is where your question comes in. The Holy Spirit's going to definitely uh, have a fun time with you. He, uh, he does with me anyways. He goes on roller coaster rides with me. He takes me on like... Uh, you know, amusement park rides like Texas Giant and Space Mountain. And he's like, woohoo! And then all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Something comes in my mind. And he'll go, yeah, remember what I told you there? And I'm like, yeah, 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 but what, 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 what are we doing over there? Well, because that's where I want you to go. Now go over there. And I'm like, what do you mean go over there? I'm in this. <laughs> and he goes, well, because I just made you see this, so I want you to go over here. Just, just go where I tell you. And then you'll end up maybe sometimes at a trail over there. Sometimes you'll come back. So if you go away, what I have found, if you go away and stay away from the context, then you definitely have to go to that context now. But if you go there just to visit, <laughs> so you don't cut the Okodomio, you don't permanently dwell on the off rabbit trail, you just kind of dwell there for a little bit, and you, and you kind of just glean, and you come back, then you're li like, like Ruth did, you glean the fields. You don't live in the fields, you glean from the, you go back to your home. So if you're gleaning and you come back, God goes, okay, the context wasn't as important over there, I just want you to get the gleanings. You don't have to know the whole scale of how how big the harvest and the field is, just pick up the gleanings, okay? Bring them back. Now, take those gleanings and apply it to this context. So it all depends on what God's intention is with you. So I can't really, I can't really tell you what the answer to that question is. That's between you and God. I can tell you it works both ways. He can say the context where you're at only matters, or he can say, you know what, that matters, and the context I'm leading you to, that's on the, that depends on the journey he's taking you on. I, I, I don't know. It depends on how he leads you. That's how he does that. He's cool like that, and it's, it's a fun ride like that because you never know. You never know. It's like going to, I mean, I'm, I'm in Orlando, so it's like going to, you know, Adventureland. I don't know what ride we're going to go on. I know it's called Adventureland, though, for a reason. I know that the, there's the options of fun, so I don't know which one he's going to take me on. I just know that as soon as I get into the park itself, I'm going to be fun. It's going to be fun just when I sit down and start reading and talking and learning from God. It's always going to be fun. I just don't know where he's going to take me. So context is king. Then I go into the, to, I build the framework, right? Then I go into the ability putting the wine in that framework, the new wineskin. That's the details, right? Then the cursory stuff comes in when he, when, when different verses come in or, or things stop in your memory and, you, and your spirit speaks to you and you go, oh, wait, I go over here. And then you, you start to illuminate over here. And then he may have you camp out over there and say, no, no, no longer glean, daughter, son. Shh, say la, as the psalmist would say. Shh, stop, quiet down. I led you here because the context over there was just the means to my end. You're like, what? I didn't want you to learn that at all. I wanted to use you to think you wanted to learn this because all along I wanted you over here. And you're like, what just happened? But those days and those moments are very beautiful, by the way, because that's when you really know that, man, is, 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 is that really cool? Because that happened to me not all the time, but it happens both ways. And either way, it's fantastic. It, it just, there's benefits and blessings on both sides of that. But I'm telling you, he works in both those ways. It's, it's fantastic. So you just have to kind of be ebb and flow and be moldable as the, because the clay, he's the potter. Yes? A lady said, when he does that, I sometimes forget where I started. <laughs> right? Yeah, but here, you see, but there, there's another thing you just talked about, piggyback on what Vicky said. So if the context is important where you're at, and so are the details. Now, the cursory is always important, but the question becomes, is the cursory or gleanings that you're going to be, the cursory is where he takes you to for the purpose of gleanings. 
But does the gleanings become just gleanings? Or do you want you to glean like the, the merchant and the pearl of great price? Does he want you to then say, oh, I found this field. The gleanings I've now gathered, I want to use it to buy a field. Uh, wh wh what? Sometimes he wants you to camp out there. And I don't know that until I get there. I don't know that heading there. There's no way you're going to know that, I don't think. I mean, I can't remember when I've ever known that ahead of time. Maybe it's true, but I don't think you're going to know ahead of time. But more often than not, you're going to go with the idea of cursory, you know, like reconnaissance, and you're just going where the Lord leads you, not knowing what to, you don't know. And you're just there, there gleaning, and he may go, <laughs> watch this, this is funny. Watch my daughter and son. They think they're gleaning. This is great. Watch, 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 watch. watch. He's going to find it. He's going to see it. He's going to see it. Ah! Look, see your face? It's awesome. She just saw a great jewel and nugget I just gave her about me and my words. And all of a sudden, you're like, what? Nancy Harbor, for example, just saw one the other day. Nancy Harbor says to me, look, look at Matthew 1 and verse 11. And I go, what's that? Now, she was just studying the, the plural words because she was so fascinated by the plural of the Greek words and how they weren't translated correctly in English. So she's really excited about that. So she on her own, God's taken her on that passage, right? And so she's studying multiple words in plural now, right? So she finds Matthew 1.11. And his brother, I mean, Matthew 1.11. And then Josiah and Jehoiachin and his brothers near the time of the carrying away of Babylon. The carrying away is metoorkesia which is plural. So carrying aways, multiple carrying aways, which in other words, in the scripture, in the actual rendering of the Greek language, the Koine Greek language, it should have been rendered into English multiple times carried away to Babylon, which would have been helpful to people to realize that was a precursor of multiple phases of the catching away of the rapture. Uh, it's in the verse, Matthew 1.11. It's meta, met, metoi oikisia. By the way, it means to change your abode. Meta is as in metamorphosis, and oikia, your abode. To change your abode, <laughs> yeah, from earth to heaven in a typical sense, but in the reality, a physical sense, from Israel to Babylon. What a, what a yowza. So Nancy saw that and was like, wow. Now, God didn't start her off looking at Babylon or, 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 or the rapture, that, but he started her off with plural words. And he led her over there, gleanings, and now she got camped out. I don't know if she's camped out there or not. She's studying more about that. But that was some of the gleanings she got. So that's a gleaning issue. If, if she's studying more and more about the, the waves or more and more about the Babylonian captivity, that would be where God's telling her, now it's no longer gleanings. Now it's, that becomes your context. To your point, says to Vicki, now that's the context I want you to study. I don't know. It's up to him how he leads you. But I find a, a lot of times it's gleanings for the most part. And then he does in times say, okay, shh, sit, calm down, relax, be still. Until you are, you'll never know that I'm God. And then he starts showing you stuff. And you're like, I had no idea. Like how he showed and revealed to me about Jesus, Yeshua being baptized on Adar. Had no clue. I wasn't looking for that. I had no idea. That was a definitive process of how a contextual study led to gleanings. And the gleanings, God said, use the gleanings to buy where you're at right now. Purchase the field of this context. Dig in, son. And I'm like, for what? What am I doing here? I don't understand. And the next thing I know, I'm like, what just happened? How did I not see this before? Where's this been? And so God does that. So, but, but not all the time he does it that way. Sometimes he does it the other way, where you're studying the context and the details and the cursory things, the gleanings you bring back, and you go, wow, that gleaning I got over there, wow, where's this been? I didn't know the context and the details spoke about things in such a way because of that cursory gleanings, it added so much more insight. And now I see it differently. We saw that in Philippians, for example, with Paul. When Paul talks about the thing he talked about, the relationship thing is so huge now. I would have never understood that if I if I didn't if we didn't have the Book of Acts, you know, have God give us in that uh, that venue of learning all that. That was a great background to really appreciate the studies of Ephesians, Colossians, and now Philippians. So, I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. But this question is actually a lot longer. I thought it would be the answer, but I hope that it's helpful, Vicky, to answer your question. If I answered your question satisfactorily. I don't know. You tell me. I know I've talked pretty fast, too. Sorry about that. I get kind of excited, you know. Is that, you're still probably typing stuff in. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, then openness, thank you. Wow, it's been quite some time since I have heard this. I think I had forgotten these methods. 
No, it's, it, it's okay though, but that, and that's the reason why we do the Q and A's. The reason why we're all human beings of of continuing to seek and learn and grow. It's never a, a point of arrival. It's always a point of pursuit. It's always a point of not saying I'm never going to fall. I'm never going to falter. I'm never going to have an issue of of you know a downtime. It's about you know, a righteous man falls six times, but he gets up seven. And again, it's it's funny how the in, in a sports analogy, the the <laughs> the Mr. October name came from Reggie Jackson, from showing up hitting big hits in in games in the baseball world when it mattered most when it's playoff time. But yet the guy struck out more than anybody else in playoff history. <laughs> I think it was at that time. He was called Mr. October. So it's like no one thinks about the negative reality that he had to come through to get to that place of notoriety. And, and that's the same point, and a, uh, that's a small microcosm that's really devaluing. It's a spiritual journey. But spiritually, it's, it's a million times bigger deal than that of when you have to experience a lot of uh, experience failures or experience this being knocked down process because it builds and grows you a lot, a lot more. So it's amazing how it, it's, it's not bad. It's actually good when you feel like, oh, my gosh, I forgot that. Because it strengthens you. It's like when you get, they say, the, the doctors might say that, you know, that heals stronger now, stuff like that. You heal stronger when you come through adversity, when you come through a lesson learned, when you come through a hardship. It makes you stronger if, in fact, you channel in and focus in on God's grace and peace and provision and purpose behind it all. And know through it all, your dad loves you. Your father loves you. That was to help and love you, not to hurt you. That was to love you. And you got to believe that first and foremost, going back to Paul's statements the Spirit told him to tell us that the foundation is love because that's how our Father deals with us. Everything's a foundation of love. Now how it manifests may not feel that way, may not seem that way, but it is that way. Yeah? Laney said it does. So, all right, so. Vicky said, yes, I'm trying to get back to doing more of this. Yep, so, and it, it's the fun, and, and, and the fun part is just, you know, seeing where God leads you. I, I'm just amazed. I, that's why I want to I do Galatians so bad, because I want to see what, what, what God's going to show in there that I haven't seen. And, and I, I, there's so many, in Ephesians, Colossians, and the Philippians, each book so far that we read about Paul, there's things I didn't know that I learned that I had no clue. I had no clue. And it's just amazing how I wouldn't have known unless the book of Acts laid the foundation that God's now drawing from constantly to, to build depth of insight into these other books. And, and, and I hit myself in the head like a V8, like, how did I not know that before? That's kind of like essential. How could I have missed that truth? I mean, duh, the book of Acts is like essential. It's like the foundational element to understand all of the Pauline epistles and understand how Peter and, and Jude and James, all of them wrote. John, I mean, how did I not? What is wrong, man? It's like, goodness gracious. You know what made me think also? At some point in, in, the, in the future, I want to go through the exact, this is going to sound crazy, I want to go through all the Gospels and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and do it verse by verse, all of them, and just go, goodness, and then you see the context of, of, of Jesus' teaching. Wouldn't that be amazing, you know, all that, and just go through all that, and that's gonna be, that, that, <laughs> that's gonna be a lifelong thing there. But the reality is that, I just wanna make sure I ended with saying, so is the answer to your question, as we got a little off topic here, wait, a lot, a little, a lot, <laughs> does, the, does the question you asked me about Matthew 27, about how to make sense, does it make sense to you now? And that answers your question satisfactorily, Sister Vicki, you tell me. I don't want to move on unless you tell me it's okay. Yes, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks be to God. As Daniel would say, it wasn't I who gave the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar, he said, but I know the one who, did, who, who does know the interpretation, and that's God, so that wasn't me, that was God that he, knew, he knows that you needed that, so praise be to God. Now, Laney asked a question that is like um, you know, a thesaurus. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay, so I want to tell you, Sister Laney, first of all, truth is, I read it and I was like, what? And <laughs> being honest, I'm not going to lie to you, okay? And then secondly, then I read it and I went, whoa, yeah, we talked about that before, but no, not all of these. Then I thought, no, no, she's right. Maybe one or two of these, not... Oh, yeah, well, I've mentioned something. Okay, no, 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 wait, wait a minute. Then all of a sudden I went, who cares about all that? That was phase, so phase one was, what? Phase two was sifting through and then the memory of, then phase three was, this is pretty cool, man. I'm going back and, I'm, and, I'm, and then God's going, hey, go over here, son, look at this. And all of a sudden now, it, it was like, God used you to, to remind me of those things that, again, I didn't know. And he's just showing things that, 
that are there right in front of me that I never saw before. Even though I've known about these. I never saw it. It's, but he'll always do that. That's just his way of saying he loves you. He's just telling you, I'm never going to stop teaching you. You know, God's never going to stop teaching us, ever. He's going to keep continually educating. He's just, he's just the master educator. He just can't help himself. He loves us so much. He wants to collaborate with us so much. He's not going to stop until he continues to invest and invest and invest in us. It's just, it's just his way. It's just an amazing thing, and it's just awesome. So your question is, so much detail, and the question is about Jesus being anointed, but you were pointing out the verses of Matthew 26, 6 to 13, Mark 14, 1 to 12, Luke 7, 36 to 50, and John 12, 1 to 8. And you asked the questions A, B, C, D. A, what is the meaning of where the woman's position was prior to the anointing of his body in each of the scriptures? Significance of his head, B. The in-depth emotional description of her in Luke versus the other descriptions. The timing in reference to the Passover mentioned in John versus the others. Why Judas is mentioned by name in Matthew and Mark and John, but not in Luke. The description of the alabaster box in each and its worth. <laughs> is there anything else that you want to know? <laughs> How's reading this going? Goodness, it's like reading a Christmas list of, of, of the kid's first Christmas. He could actually, you know, think and desire some things, and you're like, goodness, <laughs> I want to, all right, Pastor, going a baby gun. <laughs> I was like, wow. But it was fun to read, though. I was like, this is awesome. Yes. Uh, well, like I said, I didn't want to ask more, but there he is. I think she's got more to say. No, no, keep asking more, man. It's awesome. I love it. Okay, so you then you say. You don't have to cover all of this. Well, I got, I got the answers for you. The question is, do we have time? Okay, so. Then you say, questions are, the time reference to the Passover, especially in John, why the balsam, why the balsam was given a, a monetary value in Mark and John, the position of the woman in each of the accounts before she anointed his head, and also the anointing of his feet. Then you said, oh, by the way, an extra scripture, another email, a separate email, you go, oh, by the way, why was the woman not named in the first three accounts, but only in John was she named Mary? I got, got it all covered there, Lane. <laughs> all right. So here's the fun part. If you go to your last week of Jesus chart, so your first thing you have to do is your last week of Jesus Yeshua chart. That's the first thing you got to do, because on there, it's going to point out a timeline that speaks to some of these things. It was funny this week, met with grandson, and he said, what did you just say about Jesus? What? Yeshua? I go, yeah, Yeshua. Yeshua, that, that's his name in the Hebrew tongue. So if you were living in the times of him walking around, you wouldn't say, hey, Jesus, that he wouldn't respond to that. There, there's no such thing. That, that's an English rendering. It's a transliteration. And he goes, but we call him Jesus. And I go, <laughs> okay, so I said, your dad's in Puerto Rico, and his name is George here. But... Ask his mama what she called him from the day he was born till all the days he lived in Puerto Rico. Guess what it was? Jorge. And it was, and always it shall be. That's his mama. And his mama called him Jorge. She'll always call him Jorge. That's her love. That's her baby. When he was named before his dad passed away, he called him Jorge also. His family calls him Jorge. That's Jorge, Jorge, Jorge. It, that, that's who he is. Now, do they mind him being called George? No, because they know it's an Americanization of his name. It's a Western civilization into the English rendering of Jorge. Transliteration, no big deal. But why would you not want to honor when you're referencing how his mama called him? You wouldn't say George. That'd be dishonoring to act like that's what his mama called him when you know darn well it's not. She called him Jorge. And that's the reason we call Jesus Yeshua. You can say he's Jesus all you want, nothing wrong with that. But if you're saying that, if you go into a depth of that name and you say that's the name that, that God gave him, that's the name he gave himself as God, that's not true. Don't say that. It's not true. That's our name we gave him in our Western culture. It's Yeshua. And that's the name he has, okay? So we just, he doesn't mind us calling him Jesus. That's not a big, that's not a wrong thing. It's just don't get caught up in, that is the name. No, it's not. It's Yeshua. But Jesus is fine because that's our English rendering. Just like George is not disrespectful. It's only disrespectful when you say, George is how your birth certificate reads. I know it does because that's what I call you. How dare you have make that assertion? That's just ignorant, okay? Just like saying, Jesus is what it should say in every Bible. That's what I call him. Really? 
That's just ignorant. You don't, you don't make your language imposed upon God's book. That's just not smart. All right, so the last week of Jesus Yeshua chart will give you the idea of the timeline. And so first and foremost, Matthew and Mark. Matthew and Mark, you'll, you'll find Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark's account, Matthew and Mark's account, they occur on Monday, after Palm Sunday. Okay? John's account, John's account over here, John's account, well, their account, where John's account of the anointing happened on Wednesday prior so this is Palm Sunday right here, right? I'm going to say Palm Sunday is right here. This is Palm Sunday. And this is Wednesday prior. Okay? Hope you got that. That's, you won't see John's accounting on the last week of Jesus, Yeshua, because that's not the last week, right? But if you count six days from the Passover from Tuesday, because Tuesday... 6 p.m. was the Passover meal that Jesus had. And six days prior to Passover was right there. Okay? You with me? And since you have the Passover between 6 p.m. Tuesday and 6 p.m. Wednesday, you have one, two days. So that's two days prior to Passover. It's talking about two days hence. That's why they're talking about that. And they're talking about right here, this is Monday prior to Monday 6 p.m. This is, this is occurred Monday prior to 6 p.m. So one day before 6 p.m., that's still, that, that's still that, that's that Monday morning. Jewish calendar would be Sunday, Sunday evening. And then you have this evening here of Monday through this evening. So that's why you have two days later here. So this is prior to 6 p.m. This is after this is after 6 p.m. So that's first of all the timeline. Okay, the context is important. We just talked about this earlier. What a coincidence! And now you're talking about a litany of scriptures that has to be contextually understood. Now the Luke one is totally separate. The Luke one's totally not even has nothing to do with this. The Luke one has nothing to do with this whatsoever. It's totally separate by itself. The Luke one's just kind of hanging out on its own, just like a hanging chad on its own. Has nothing to do with the last week of Jesus at all. And that's Luke, that's Luke 7, 36, and I thought on the board there, actually. 36 and 50. This occurred. In the latter part of Jesus' ministry. Okay? So, it wasn't in the first half, it's in the latter part, but the reality is that we don't know exactly what time it was, but I tell you this, it wasn't in the last week or in the last two weeks, it's nowhere near that. About the same thing. All right? So, two different things. You with me? So far. Because that's important. For the, you, got, you got it? Babe? 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 I'm sorry. Hello? Is it, I probably don't be too tired now. Come on. Oh, What'd she sorry. say? What'd she say? She said yes. Okay, so. Uh, now, Vicki said, can you send us Lainey's questions? Yeah, I will. So, the. So this occurred later. Okay, so now the reality is that you're asking the question about how you got Matthew and Mark occurred on Monday after Palm Sunday, but John occurred six days before that, which was Wednesday prior. So he was in Bethany the week prior to Palm Sunday. We know this from our previous studies, but I want to remind you of that. So that's the first thing. That's the easy part. 
The tough part is your questions. But that, this will help out a ton. So let me give you an idea here, by the way. So in math, and, and John, it says clearly that it's Mary, and they're at Martha and Lazarus' house. Whereas here, they're at Simon the leper's house, as well as here, it's the same thing. Simon the leper's house was in here and here, right? So Lazarus' house is separate over in John 12. What happened in John 11? So that's because if you think about the last week, I'm going to do Luke 7 last and address these first, okay? Because they happened in the same week. They're the ones that are more of the common thread of timeline. She said okay. All right. So John is really cool because I'll put it down here. So, so if you think about this, so in here it says there's a Pharisee in Luke, and then later on it's going to tell you it's a Pharisee in Luke uh, 7.36, and then over in verse 43 he's going to say Simon. So then people say, well, Simon the leper was a Pharisee. that believed in Jesus, people say. Which is kind of interesting. People say this because of these verses that tie in easily why they would say that. Ah, can't even read this. Goodness gracious, come on, Preston. If I could spell, it'd be nice. Goodness. Okay. All right, so then, as you have this here, right, verse 43, so in, but back in John, it's again, the only time it's mentioned Lazarus' house, in John, right here. He's the one, Lazarus' house. He is a big deal. Is Lazarus, here's the question, when you're doing the context of events like this, now you see here's where the context, not of the actual passage itself is important so far. It's going to be important in a minute. But what's more important right now, when you're comparing events, you've got to ask the question, what, like the old thing when you were a kid, one of these things is not like the other. Which one has a hat? <laughs> Which one's missing a dog? And you go, oh, that one has only three legs and not four, right? Well, hello. Uh, this house is a lot different. Lazarus' house, why is that? He kind of liked Lazarus a lot. Oh, I don't know. He kind of raised him from the dead. Just saying. Big deal. Big deal. Oh, by the way, and not just anybody from the dead, not like a daughter or, or somebody else later on in the scripture, the son. No, 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 no. This guy was dead four days, okay? He was clearly dead. He was a goner. There was no like people going, oh, there, she's just sleeping. Oh, they're just out of oxygen for a while. He's like, they're like going, no, no, they, they, their lungs weren't moving, Jesus, when you revived the other children before. But now you're saying that you can't possibly say this about Lazarus because we wrapped him up. We put him in the tomb. The brother gone. <laughs> he's like, oh, I know he's gone to you. Watch this. Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Yeah, that's awesome. I still think that's one of the most fantastic stories in the whole entire Bible. Because there's that singer, Carmen, if you want to hear a fantastic song, Lazarus, come forth, Google it, listen to it. It's awesome. It's awesome. He has a whole story. It's like a story song about Lazarus, come forth. And about portraying how it must have been Lazarus and the abode of the dead in Abraham's bosom in paradise, and you're talking to Abram and Moses and all the people going, hey, what's going on, guys? And all of a sudden, Lazarus. Because you have to, I, now, it's a story, kind of a jesting thing, but think about that. If Jesus called his name out and he called and he came forth, does that mean that Abram, Moses, and the rest of them, Esther, Rachel, all of them heard the name? David, Solomon, did they not hear? 
<laughs> That's just freaky to think about that, man. That they're going, is he calling you? Who are you again? Like, I don't remember you being mentioned in the pre, you know, pre-stole prophet king days. He's like, um, yeah, I'm from, I'm actually seeing all the things you guys talked about and were told was going to happen. Saw it. Been there. <laughs> He's like, you saw the, 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 the God that we, you, you, you hugged him. Shut up. He's like, oh, no, 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 man. Saw it. Talk with them face to face. They're like, no way. I, you can imagine what he probably, you know, who knows, right? So here's Lazarus coming forward. So this is a big deal, remember? Such a big deal that forget what I say, forget what Jesus says for a second. If you want to think that Jesus is biased because he loves him so much or, 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 that, or that I'm biased, people say, well, I'm just saying that because he raised him from the dead. What about the people of this day that were his enemies, Jesus' enemies? They wanted to kill Lazarus because he was an example, definitively, that he has power over death in the grave. Remember? I want to take him out. So he's a big deal. This, ha this guy's a big deal. Just telling you. So chapter 11, what does Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. It's awesome. So he says that, chapter 12, in, in this context, that just happened. Mary just heard that happen, by the way. She just saw that happen. Now, I don't know about you. That would change me. <laughs> I'm just saying. Come on, man. You can't see Lazarus dead and been dead for four days. Top of that, Jesus hears the news, waits two days to get there, and he gets there, the famous Jesus wept verse, because it was her conversation with him that he was, if you were here, a brother wouldn't have died. He's like, your brother wouldn't have died. Oh my gosh, do you not know? Okay. And then the whole miracle happens. And you have this tremendous chapter prior to of this miracle, and Mary's right there, front and center. And so now you wonder why, what's happening here? And you say, why is there not an alabaster box present in John? I'll tell you why. Because this is a, this is a foreshadow, an example, a type of the maturity of Mary. That's why she's mentioned in John and John only. She's not mentioned anywhere else, even though I believe strongly she is the one in Matthew and Mark. I think she's the same one there, myself. I think it's her, myself, <laughs> I do. Now in Luke, I don't think it's her. I don't think it's her in Luke, maybe, but I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure. But I definitely think it's her in Matthew and Mark, and I'll tell you why. Because when she has, when she's in, in, in John's passage, in John 12, if you go to John, so in John 12, you read the passage, and he says this. And in John he says, Then Jesus six days, Yeshua, before the Passover came to Bethany, where that Lazarus was, was whom Jesus raised from the dead, they made him therefore supper, or a dipnon, like Laney points out, a dipnon's in view. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Then Mary, having taken a pound of balsam, genuine spikenard, no mention of an alabaster box, none, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. That's not recorded in Matthew and Mark. Just his head, not his feet, right? And she said, and the house was filled with the odor of the balsam. And one of his disciples, Judas is a carrot, or he is a carrot, who was about to betray him, says, why was that not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Well, remember, over in, in John, so in John, what do you have? John, what's in view? What's in view is the, inher is the is, is inheritance. Ah. is the inheritance and that's why he says it's, it's six days prior because six is man's inheritance that's the number for man's inheritance in the numbers so that's what's in view and then you see her and she comes in and she has she has a, a balsam. Lainey said, oh, I didn't see that at all. And she had, well, I'm going to show you, watch this. It's 300, it's 300, it's 300, uh, what's it? It's a pound of balsam worth 300 denarii. 
And she said six. It's 300 denarii, which is actually 30. Hello. So we got 30 here, you know, times 10, right? So that is, is a fruit yield. She said a year's wage. Mm -hmm. If you want to be technical about it, the actual denarii, which is um, 300, it's a day's wage, it's actually worth, that's actually, so that's 300 denarii, that's 300 days work, which is just short of a year. So she gave almost three-fourths of her yearly income. So much for tithe, right? So, <laughs> uh, and to use to, to do what? What was she doing, though? The whole purpose of what she was doing here, and John, as you go and read the story again, she was actually, she said that she has it, genuine spite, not very costly, anointed his feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. What was she doing? She was showing as a 30-fruit yield Dianea person that she had to be to his feet subjected to his sovereign will, enemies under his feet. His feet speaks to subjection because the scripture is clear. He'll put every enemy under his feet, under his footstool. It speaks to subjection. When you think his feet speaks to subjection, it speaks to humility of the one who's doing the feet like he did with the disciples. He humbled himself and washed their feet. When we are washing his feet, we're humbling ourselves to be subservient to our king, to our sovereign master. You're acknowledging that there is no free will, and you're acknowledging, you're acknowledging that he is the master, that he, he is in charge. And when you have a Dionea understanding, you lack that. You lack the ability to grasp and to submit to the sovereign hand of God in your life in everything. And so when she is taking herself from a 30 fruit times 10, 300, she's basically saying my 30 fruits ordained purpose is right now to subject myself to my master. What I just saw he just did? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm subjecting myself to the resurrection and the life. you got to be kidding me. He just raised my brother from the dead. Oh, I've changed. You want to say how much I've changed? Three-fourths of my wages that my doctrinal understanding, my wineskin and my wine, I am pouring it out, baby. It doesn't matter what I thought I knew. What matters is I subject myself to him so I can think and know what I need to do, what I need to know, what I need to be, not what I was. Because he just showed me that what Lazarus was, was no more. He was made brand new. Now, wasn't he? Uh, yeah. So he, she's th she's show she is exemplifying the fact that spiritually she has to put away her old wine, her old wine skin, and she has to be broken and spilled out. That's like that song because she is the beginning of this last week. It's coming to fruition now. It's, it's, it's speaking to her mind, her heart, her spirit because we're coming up from the last week leading into Jesus' leaving on this planet. And she's at the light bulb going off. And so now she goes from a, she's a type of that person who no longer is saying, I'm not going to be no foolish virgin, Jack. Oh, I'm taking my old wine skin. I'm taking my old, old, old wine, and I'm breaking and pouring out for the feet of Jesus. I am subjecting my thoughts, my spiritual being, my old life, my present life. I'm subjecting myself to him so that he, 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 the living word, the word of the written word of God will change me. And she's using her own hair to evidence that. That's the subjection of not just her doctrinal statement, but of herself. Her hair was used to wipe his feet. It wasn't just what was deposited in her by God at that time that needed to change, that needed to be poured out and refreshed. It was herself. Because she's the one who accused him. She's the one, going back to John 11, watch. She's the one that said the things that made Jesus weep. John 11, verse 32, Mary, when she saw when she saw him come, when she came where Jesus was seeing, was seeing him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus therefore saw her weeping. And her weeping, he was greatly agitated in the spirit. He was, he was hurt by it. Because what she said was not like a belief aspect of it. It was like more of a sense of, why did you do this? Why did you not come here earlier? 
you'd know that by his reaction. It wasn't done with a good tense, a good state, a good state. And he said in verse 34, where, or she said, and, she, and, and said, where have you laid him? He said, and they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, the famous Jesus wept. And the Jews therefore said, behold, how he loved him. Do you don't think that that indelible emotional exchange was etched in her mind and heart forever? That's why she's mentioned by name. That's why Josh talking about the inheritance, because she had a personal encounter. She had a personal deepening of being born again already, that she had known Jesus differently. But now the Annie was here. He was already born again, typologically speaking. But now the Annie was being upped. She was becoming more aware of her calling, that what is, what, uh, he's close to us. He loves us. He visits us a lot in this house. I just saw him cry. I just saw a reaction I haven't seen before. And behold, how that must know that how much he loves my brother. And then what was about to happen, he raised him from the dead. Yowza. You don't forget that event, man. You don't forget funerals as they are, let alone when the dead stand up. You kind of remember those. Just saying. So Mary was mentioned by name because what just happened was kind of yowza. So that's why she mentioned by name. She was the one who was a 30 fruit yield person. She had the ordained completion. She had a hundred of again a hundred pounds of this of this uh, this the spike nard uh, or a pound of spike nard. Excuse me, uh, meaning meaning a pound of spike nard that was worth 300 denarii, which is a hundred times 30 or 100. Excuse me, which is 30 times 10, which is 300, the, 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 what it's worth. And so the reality is that what you have here is the reason why Judas was in the picture is because what does a foolish virgin have in common? A, a Diane, a 30 fruit you have in common person? They presume upon God. What did Judas do? Presumed upon God. Upon God what? He presumed he could take and twist the arm of God and have Jesus proclaim himself as Messiah. That's why he was present. That's why he said that, because he thought with what he already knew, it was enough. He didn't need to learn and know what else God was trying to show and teach him through how she, he, she was being used to expound and break and spill out the spike nard and herself. All he saw was what he knew was the value of it and what it could do for the poor. And Jesus is like, that's like old wine and old wineskins, Judas. you got to let go of what you think and what you already past tense have believed. You need to understand and receive what you need to believe. What I'm trying to tell you right now, what I am telling you, but you don't listen because you presume upon me. Because foolish virgins, Dianea understanding people, think they have it all down and they forget to open up continuously their eyes, continuously their ears, continuously their heart. You cannot presume upon God what you think something means about him or his word. It needs to stop. And that's why he was mentioned, because he's the icon of that, of all the disciples. That's what he did. So that's what makes sense. And that's what Mary was doing before when she said, if you had been here, she presumed upon him. If you were here, you would say, he's like, that wasn't the point if, if I was here. But I wasn't. Hello. You should know by now I do things for a reason. And everything's in my time. There's no should have been, could have been. Your brother didn't die by accident without my will. How do you not know this? Come on. I'm here now. And you know what that means. Nothing that you thought was real is real, is it? Watch this. Oh, you don't understand? Oh. And Mary's like, oh, my goodness. I presumed upon you that my timeline, my life of understanding of physics and life and death, I was holding you to those boundaries. Duh. No, 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 she was thinking. I'm not going to let this get past me. Next chapter in, boom. She embalms his feet. She divests herself, everything she used to know, everything she used to be, and she's at his feet being subjected. That's what that's about in John. That's why she's mentioned by name. I'm going to stop because we have three other verses, to go, three other ones to go to. But so far, Laney, does that make sense to you? Are you with me so far? Because your question is expounds, it's, it's, it's wide and vast. I need to know if you're with me so far. You see there, babe? Yeah, I'm starting to. Oh, okay. Are you with me so far? Just is, is that making sense so far? If it's not, I got to go back and make sure before I go forward. Are we good? She said, "Okay, amazing insight, and yes." 
Okay. And that's why the Dipnon was being prepared because he was preparing a Dipnon out, uh, they were preparing a Dipnon which they weren't having supper yet was being prepared. And, and he says here, it says, and they made him a supper, right? And therefore a supper there and Martha served, right? So they made him a supper because what's in view is, what was in view there was the Dipnon was in view of being served but in order to partake of the Dipnon, you have to go from a 30 to a higher fruit yield. In order to do that, you got to lose your Dionea. You got to lose yourself. You got to lose your presumptions and subject yourself to God. And that's why the Dionea, the, di what the, the Dipnon was in view. And the Dionea needed to be gone away with, and the Sunim, a deeper understanding, needed to be received. Yes? The lady said, I get it. Where was Judas? Well, uh, as far as we know, he was, he was there. The disciples were with him. He saw that. He saw that. More and more reasons feeding into his narrative that he's the Messiah. Let's do this. Let's tell the Sanhedrin. I'll show you who he is because I know he's the man. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. He's just telling scriptures left and right. He's doing miracles left and right. He's teaching out off, off the charts, authority and understanding. It blows me away. He's the guy, man. I know he's the guy. I believe all day long he's the guy. But he's not going to, you know, looks like anytime soon, be the king. And I, I need this whole the ter tyranny, the tyranny of Roman to end here. I'm tired of this. So, yeah, I'll, I'll make it so you guys can force him to be the guy. It, it, no, don't presume upon God. Bad idea. It never works well out, never works out well for you. Don't do that. So and that she, was that one. So now you go over to. And she uh, said, took him for granted. Oh, well, I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it's just, it, we do that. We take, we take the living word and the written word for granted. And that leads us to presume upon God that 